you need to think sometimes your career growth is going to be less of a ladder, more of a lattice. So you can shift from one point and shift laterally, not upwards. You may have to step back to get into something else and things like that. So we, we need to maintain that level of flexibility so that we are able to learn and then see how our new, newly acquired skills can be applied to whatever we've had before. So when I'm thinking of, if I, if I decide more that I want to be a financial accountant in a company, in operations completely, I'm not just going as a data entry personnel at this point. I'm telling them, look, I have skills in this area and this area and this area. And as long as I'm able to bring all this together and help the organization see what value, what extra value I'm bringing, then I have an edge over anybody who is just coming as someone who knows debit and credit in accounting. Right. Absolutely. Wow, that was a really good answer, Runyeka. And um, I'm really, I actually didn't know, even though I've been through your profile a couple of times, I didn't know you had so much mobility. And, you know, Deloitte is an audit firm and you are you you had so much experience in audit. So I thought you would be involved with audit at Deloitte as well. But, oh, hey. And, uh, audits, audits can get very monotonous for someone who just wants to do other <laughs> stuff. So, yeah, so it's, it's so rule based that you're stuck with this is the standard, it's what you're supposed to do. Right. It doesn't give a lot of room for flexibility and movement. And it's, it can be quite exhausting to be an audit, really, because there is always work to do, and there's right. less time for you to really give attention to some of the other things that, that you're interested in. But for a start, I really advise people to try and get into audit if they can at the start of their career. It is such an eye opener and it, it gives you so much exposure. If you're really paying attention to what you're doing beyond the exact job role you were given, if you're paying attention to everything else about the organization, you have the financial statements all the time with you. You start from there to understand what this company, this is their core businesses, this is how they make their money, this is the kind of risk they face, and things like that. So it's, it's a real eye-opener. So anyone who can get into audit at the start of their career, hmm. really try it. It's, it's, it's amazing, really. So this brings me to my next question, which is going to dive into um, the analytics field where um, you certainly are an expert. Um, could you dig a little deeper into your journey with analytics and um, give us a summary of how you started on this journey? What are the courses you've done and what drove you to study this field in such depth um, instead of you know, acquiring uh, traditional business skills in finance or in any other paradigm? Yeah, so um, I, read, I read an article about this on Medium a few weeks ago, I think. And um, yeah, so I, I really got um, knowledge of analytics during my um, CA induction. And we had this man who came to speak to us. He, he's a BI expert. And he just talked to us that yeah, he, he said so much about not just being a data entry accountant, and seeing how we can use technology in, in the work that we do. And that was in 2017. And it really got me thinking after the event. I, I went back home and I really thought about it. And then I went online and just began to run. I don't recall the exact things I was looking for, but I think I searched for stuff like technology and accounting or something weird like that. <laughs> and, and then I got to see data, data analytics and data science. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. So I, I took some time and I began to read the articles I found about it. And it, talks, it said so much about data literacy um, in business. And um, I, I, I also tried to look for how the accountants or um, someone in finance can, can bring more value to their company having this level of skills. And so I saw there was so much, there was so much in, in the whole analytics field. There were people who were business analysts or business intelligence people. And there were those who they call the data scientists and also, and, and I, also had to, so I had to ask myself at that point, what do I really want to do here? Do I want to go into data science proper? Do I want to be a business analyst? Right. And asking this kind of questions will help streamline your, your study area. So you know what to focus on when you begin to study. Yeah, so and then I went on EDX and I just type data, I, I type data science, I think. And, and then I saw this course from Harvard, Harvard University on R. And I went back on Google again and I searched R. And I read stuff about it and I'm like, okay, this isn't bad since um, part of my future goal, <laughs> I, I dream and I see myself sometimes in the World Bank, right? <laughs> And, and, and so, yeah, really. And, and right down the line, there was stuff about R and Python and this and that. 
Right. And so I asked myself, yeah, okay, if I want to work in the World Bank, what's the kind of what program would I need to learn? What's the kind of work they do there? And I found that a lot of it had to do with research. And R was a very good is a it's a very good statistical tool. So I thought to myself, okay, maybe I should learn R instead, right? Rather than Python, because beyond finance and account, which R is really good for, my future goal is to be in an organization like this. And I I think that this, this, having this technical knowledge is going to be an edge for me when I decide to move there. It's not happening yet, but hopefully it will happen soon. <laughs> wow. And, uh, yeah, and so that's what, that's what led me into studying data analysis, data analytics. Yeah. So and what I found out of recent is that we put so much interest in these really big tools, visualization and Tableau and um, Click and mm-hmm. Alteryx and all those stuff. And we forget that something very basic is always in our computers, which is Microsoft Excel. Yeah. Yeah. And just recently, I told myself, well, let's just see what is in Excel. Like, I've learned so much in our analytics and visualization and data science. But I thought not every company will, be, will have access to this kind of tools, right? So, but every company can have access to Excel the cheapest yeah. thing in the market, right? And it has this enterprise wide value. And so I thought, let me try and see what Excel has to offer. And then I realized that everything I was learning in R was right there in Excel too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I decided to pause everything else and just really dig into Excel. And I started seeing tools I, I, I don't use on a daily basis. I'm like, oh, I can run regression here. And oh, I can do this here. And it's been, it's been such an exciting, <laughs> really. It's been such an exciting experience so far. Like sometimes I stay up till 2 a.m. and I'm just digging into Excel and I yeah. go on and I'm like, how do I find this? And I, I see post on it and I go back there and I try that. And sometimes it takes a lot more, you know, coding than you would in, in maybe Python or in R. But the point is that this very basic tool that is right there in front of us every day can do everything. With more lines of code, yes, but... When you, when you think about the kind of companies you'll work in tomorrow, the fact that what you know may not be available there, but yeah. what you have is available in these companies, then it becomes very, very important to actually learn how Excel works at the advanced level and then try to apply that instead. So yeah, back to your question. Um, with accounting, you want to offer more than just being a debit and credit entry person, right? You, you want to be someone who can take hold of this transactional data that companies have and derive insights from them. So when there's management meetings, you have something more than saying, this is our property, this is our loss. So you're able to tell um, what, what businesses um, contribute more to the profit margin, right? Are there particular customers that contribute more to this? And when you think of risk too, part of risk is when, when you think to yourself that there is maybe a small group of customers who are driving profits, you then need to ask yourself, if we lose these customers, what happens to us? Does the business die, right? Or if there are just specific manufacturers that you buy from, is it just these people? If, if there is a strike action in those companies or they lose access to maybe their raw materials and stuff, what happens to your production? So these are the kind of risk-based insights you can get from analytics, and then you can try to fix this. So with customers, you can try to widen your customer brackets, right? Get more people, get more customers who are not maybe within this particular small group or subcluster. And cluster analysis is also functional here at this point. And, and so these are the kind of information you can get from analytics. So it goes beyond just your profits and your losses. And then it, you, you begin to think backwards towards um, what are the key drivers for this, for this, this, this business metrics. Yep. Wow, that's actually so relevant to what's happening today in the world. Um, you know, you you evidently mentioned of how it helps us analyze. You know, whether if if a if a particular supplier loses his raw material, what happens? And I think and I think a lot of businesses are facing very very similar problems to that today. Um, so thank you for that amazing answer. And I would like to segue into our next question. Um, given that some of our students um, viewing this may not perfectly know what role analytics actually plays in a business operation like an investment bank or a consulting firm. Um, could you sort of break down for them in simple terms how this area helps them achieve their broader goals? I know you um, iterated upon this in your previous answer, but if you could just explain um, as to how this contributes to their broader goal and how it furthers it in a way. All right, so um, with every kind of business, there are 
three metrics to keep in mind. Revenue, where the money is coming from. Costs, how we are spending the money. And risk, what could go wrong with us, right? And um, when, when you keep these three very key areas in mind, then you, you begin to think of what feeds into it. What other business functions affect it? your customers, your, 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 your manufacturers, or your vendors, rather, right? Because it depends on the kind of industry you are. Um, regulations affecting you locally, internationally, um, inherent risk within the company, um, the ones that are external to you, but could also have an adverse effect on you, right? So um, for different companies in different sectors and different industries, there are different things that drive them. So depending on what you are, I'd say that the major thing to keep in mind is to have an understanding of what drives the three key metrics for your company. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with investment companies, but the little I have with them, I know that a lot of them tend to be regulated at the national level in a country, right? right. And um, a lot of times these, these, these regulators bring up new rules and new laws and say you have to report certain things and not report these and you need to do this with your customers more and when you're reporting your financial statement, you need to disclose this and that. And you know, these things yeah. change all the time, mm -hmm. right? And, and because they are so highly regulated because they deal with public funds, they, they also tend to face really stiff penalties when they, when they default, right? Right. So, yeah. So, um, part of the role analytics can play now in these in this areas is, for example, maybe a company that has different, is in different countries, right? Multinationals, you have mm -hmm. operations in different places. Each of the places you have operations and have their own rules, have their own regulations, right? And you, you sometimes you, your, your plan might be to figure out a way to maybe um, integrate all this together, like bring it in together. So let me take, for example, part of the work I do is um, KYC and anti-money laundering checks for companies, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there is a global law for this, right? But there are also local laws too for this within companies. Or okay, let me even come more close to home. Think of accounting and think of the IFRS standards and the IESs, yeah. right? And a lot of countries have their own local gap. I know that the U.S. don't even spend the whole IFRS thing. Their interest is in their U.S. gap, except for yeah. public listed entities, right? <laughs> yeah, except for public listed entities. So um, you, you see that in reporting, when you're trying to consolidate account. You're asking yourself, oh, how do we bring in this and this law together? And how does it work? What does our local law say? Does our local law supersede the international law? Or does that one supersede our local law? And things like that. So... Um, Part of analytics is not just the tool you're using, right? It's, it's the thinking that is involved in, in deciding what, what um, method will be best applied to solve their unique problem of those businesses. So um, part of the thinking will be, yes, you, you need to understand what the actual business problem is, which is like, obviously that's the first step, right? Know what the actual issue is. You may not have this information, but there are key people in the companies who have an understanding of what their own unique problem might be in their different departments. Someone in finance is thinking about monetary impact. Right. Someone in a different department is thinking about something entirely different. So if you're able to get maybe personal interviews with these different people, and then you bring their, 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 their different, um, their different concerns basically together. And then you ask yourself, What's the business opportunity here? How do we, what kind of solution do we bring that answers all these questions for all these people? Okay. It might not just be one solution. It might be a solution that you have to iterate over time and over time to make it perfectly work. But yeah. I'd say that really to a large extent, the thinking to get to that point where you're actually now doing something with the tools you have available with you is the most important part of every analytical okay. thing. So you need to learn how to think critically know how to ask the right questions. That is very important. You can spend days asking questions and then spend just one day fixing the problem. But if, if, you, don't know the, if you don't know the actual problem, then you can bring a solution that doesn't answer the questions yeah. they have. And then you're back to it again from the beginning. Yeah. So the key thing is to ask the right questions, understand what the actual concern is 
context of the different key stakeholders in the business. And then based on the knowledge you already have, think of ways that you can solve that problem using the, what they have actually available in the company. Right. We talk about cloud infrastructure so much. Not every company can afford to pay for cloud infrastructure, <laughs> right? right? So if, if you're right. suggesting that to them, you don't need to check what is the most regular bottom line. If they decide to start paying for cloud space, would they have any money left? You get, so your, your, your business solution has to be something that is unique to each company. So that's why I, when I, I, don't, I don't like to give specific responses to this because every company has different things yeah. that is wrong with them. But your own goal as an analyst or a data scientist or whatever is to find solutions that will serve that particular company, solve yeah. their particular problem in a way that is best suited for them considering the resources that they have on ground. That's wow! It. Again, I'm, I'm I'm baffled at how comprehensive you make every single answer and how how you touch all the bases in such a subtle way. And I think our students have a lot to take away from that. Um, I'd like to take a little deeper now. And I, I remember you spoke about learning R as your first programming language, and then finding that Excel does a lot of what R already does. So um, I want to ask you, what really do programming languages in specific achieve in organizations that can't be achieved with certain tools like Excel, like you mentioned, like, you know, um, like what um, does the usage of R or Python mean in an organization that's different? Um, so in Python, I don't use Python, but I talked to a lot of people who do use Python and, mm -hmm. and the key thing they talk about that is that it's really good for automation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So if, if you're thinking of building a process that, can be usable over and over again, then Python is good for automation. But then again, I've seen people also on LinkedIn who say they use R to do everything they use Python for. Right. So, so I guess everything works either way. But um, I, I, I'd say that if you're going to an organization where a certain tool is already in use, then it's best to learn what your colleagues know. Okay. So it's, you're, able, you're able to collaborate with them and do the kind of work they're doing. If you're going to a company where nothing is on ground and you just have to build up from scratch, and I think that you have the liberty to bring in whatever knowledge you have into it, but you also have to consider what resources they have on ground and how you're able to integrate what you know into what they have. Otherwise, everybody has Excel. So honestly, knowing what I know today, I'd say learn Excel. Maybe while learning Excel, you can decide to learn Python or R. But coming to, when, when I look at job descriptions, I see a lot of companies ask for Python. A good number of them to say Python or R. But yeah. I, I know I see a lot of Python. So again, depending on where you see your career going to in the future, you may decide to pick a tool. If you're looking at pure statistical stuff, research-based thing and things like that, I think I would really good job because they have a very, very good um, interface for visualization and data analysis. Okay. When it comes to data science, they still have packages for data science, but um, from some tests I've seen in the past, um, I think Python is faster. Okay. Right. But basically what Python can do, R can do it too. And the things R can do, Python can do it. Yeah. Right. And I've actually been following you on LinkedIn for a while and I've seen that you get caught up in the Python versus R debate quite a few times. Oh God, it's, it's exhausting. It's really exhausting because I don't see the point of it. It's not like I'm laying R. It's not like anything anyone says is going to make me wake up tomorrow through R and go learn Python. I don't have that kind of energy. Right? <laughs> So I, I think it's a very counterintuitive argument for anyone to be having. Just focus on what you're learning, learn it well, know it very well, and then you can decide to get up in knowledge of how the other thing works so that wherever it is you are, you are. Yep. That makes a lot of sense, Onyeka. Um, I'd like to dive into our next question. Um, what advice do you have um, to give a student who is looking to make progress in this field in terms of starting points and outlining a long-term trajectory to master these concepts that will actually help them, help apply them to their careers and progress, you know? Okay. Um, first things first, know why you're doing this. Because this, this, this is a continuous learning Field. You're never going to stop learning. There is always going to be something new. 
either completely new or, or an adjustment to something you've known before and there's a fresh rub doing it and you know things like that just there's, there's always something out there that is just fresh completely yeah and you're saying oh i learned this way and i'm like oh there's an easier way of doing it I'm like okay how does this work right um so i'd say you should have an understanding of why you want to do this and i really let that be very clear and advice write it down somewhere because at some point learning you will get frustrated that always happens to everybody you will get tired, frustrated, but knowing why you're doing it is the one thing that is just going to keep you going consistently. And then find a community of other learners too. This, it serves really, really good purpose because it just helps to encourage you and motivate you to keep trying. Even when right. you're failing, you just keep trying, right? Um, so when it comes to technical skills, um, then a programming language, for many it's Python, for some other people it's R, whatever, learn Excel. There are courses that take data analysis in Excel. You find them on Coursera, I think. So learn yeah. the basic functionalities, learn the advanced functionalities. I advise to learn statistics. You need to know statistics because a lot of what you're going to do would involve statistical analysis, um, t-test and chi-square test and, you know, distributions and probability things like that. So um, it's a really good understanding of how statistics works, how to, you know, inference and modeling, um, univariate and multivariate analysis, regressions. Right. So um, the tools you're learning will give you output, right? You're knowing what to put um, um, rainfall is a, is, 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 is um, you know, a function of, um, you know, humidity and this and sunlight and stuff like that. Right. Get. But, it's like computer, whatever you put is what it's going to give you back. And you, you, how you would judge someone who really knows what they're doing is how they interpret the results that they get. So the purpose of learning statistics really well is to be able to interpret the results you're receiving. And then we, we, a lot of people seem to think that maybe when it comes to analytics, it's just, oh, you've done this and this result has come up and this is it. But intuition plays a very big role in, in analytics so what you know and what you feel could be uh, affecting this okay let me give an example you think of um, maybe you're thinking of companies and their employees right and you see things like maybe one of the variables and one of the factors involved in maybe um, employee attrition is um you see the age and you see maybe the work experience and things like that and intuition tells you already um, someone who is older likely has more work experience mm. than someone who is younger you know, things like this, and some things are just so basic, and you think of correlation, and you realize this already have this already correlated, your age, your work experience, your salary growth, it's, it's all correlated, right? So, right. You, know that having, you know that having these three variables together in a linear model doesn't make any sense, because right. you, they all have the same effect on, on, your, on your outcome, right? Yeah. Okay? So, these are, these are intuition. So, you can run your model to test so that intuition is right, right and sometimes you might be getting results that doesn't make any sense you're thinking uh, no this should be this way but this is giving me this result so you need to go back again and check if you've made a mistake somewhere mm -hmm. yeah you get that so 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 much of this is is intuition is prior knowledge and then on the soft skill part i'd say that you need to understand how to communicate your findings it's it's one problem that technical people tend to have communicating technical results to business-oriented yeah. people. They, and then I guess saying jargons, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> so you, you, you need to learn how to break down that, that, that whole technical nonsense to these people who just understand money, yeah, <laughs> and right. understand profit, <laughs> and understand cash, and stuff like that. So you need to be able to break down everything you found to, to, to their level of understanding otherwise there's going to be this communication gap between you and them right so um understand communication but how to present your findings 
um, people are so used to dashboard these days. You throw everything in bar charts and pie charts, and some charts don't make any sense. <laughs> you look at, oh, really? You look at it, and you, you, you're wondering, well, what are they trying to say here? What's going on here? And you just draw trend lines on everything, and it doesn't make any sense to the person reading it. So when, when you're trying to present your finding, you need to keep the audience in mind. It's not about showing off your skill sets, like good at this i need to show everybody that i'm good at this right <laughs> yes, yes. If, if these are people who only understand how bar charts work right. present it in bar charts and put in numbers at least they can see you know and, and they, see, they can see what's going on i don't even advise anybody to touch pie charts ever like where you can use a bar chart forget a pie chart because when you think of human psychology people people do not really understand angles it doesn't make sense so much as much as they understand lengths and numbers and you know things like that so when, when you're presenting you need to think of that think of the skill you're presenting your findings in i think the things that actually make sense to people right um and and so um communication presentation these matters um how to talk <laughs> we, 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 we yeah. downgrade that so much but we don't put so much interest in that but it, it matters that you you know how to speak to the people in the room wow i cannot begin to i see this after every question i'm noticing that how you touch every base and how you're so succinctly describing how it affects all stakeholders and how all parties involved need to be taken care of and how you need to change according to that and i'm going to segue that last line into my next question um i'd like to ask you if you could shed a little light on applying these concepts and the importance of knowing how to do that i read in a quote that you said if there is no awareness about business cases then there's no use of data literacy and i'd like you to speak of how you use these skills um, as you're working with the team in deloitte and how an average business manager should look at it when they're learning such skills all right um, so when we talk about data literacy, you're, you're trying to make this a company-wide culture. You want everybody in the company to have an understanding of data and how to read the information that is provided. Okay, so they might not be the one generating it, but you want everyone to have an understanding of how to read information that has been, that has been generated by somebody else. If, if a company is sending uh, company-wide emails and saying this is how we have performed during the during this period, um, maybe from January to June, happy results, and they just put it. If, if you go to companies' website and you look at their summary financial statements, you rarely see too many um, tables and numbers. You just see charts everywhere, right? So, are you able to actually read these charts? Do you have an understanding of what the company is trying to communicate via these charts? Do you understand? So this is part of what data literacy is all about. It's it's being able to read information that has been gotten from data of whatever business you're referring to. So when I when I talked about um having business knowledge and having an understanding of the business problem for data literacy to work, um, we're thinking of um, like I said before, it is it is unique to businesses. There is no one size fits all for every business, but there are three things that will always count for them. It's your revenue, your cost, your risk. And when you think of all those things, you also want to look at how, you know, within the company, outside the company, what's environmental factors, what internal factors are driving mm -hmm. revenues and costs and risk management within the company. So every person within a company needs to have an understanding of, you know, on, understand where you work, in fact. If, if I'm working in a company in manufacturing, our key drivers will be different from somebody who's working in a consulting firm. It will be different for somebody who's in financial services. Do you understand? So um, when a company is giving information and saying this is the regulatory, um, the new regulation that affects us as a company, that regulation affecting the financial sector is different from the regulations affecting the person who is in maybe um, manufacturing. They are different things altogether. So you need to understand how your external environment or internal environment affects where you are. And then 
so that when, when companies are providing your information and data about these things, you, you get what, what's really going on. And in recent times, this is with COVID-19, and what we see how it's affecting different countries in different ways. Like in Nigeria, it's affecting differently. A lot of companies have laid off workers <coughs> with good explanations for doing it, right? I read the other day where Airbnb CEO said that it took them, I think, about 12 years to build a company, and over just six months for so many things to come crashing down. Right. Yeah. Now, when they say they are laying off workers, if you if you if you're within the business and you don't understand how the macro environment has affected that particular business that you are in, it's easy to feel disgruntled that you're being laid off, right? You 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 feel bad and you think, oh, I've lost my job. These guys are really bad for making me lose my job. But you also see also that they have lost real businesses because of the ban on traveling. Their business model is really about tourism that you can travel to different countries and find someone to house you there. That's their business model. And so when you come to countries that are shutting down borders and saying, no leaving, no coming in, yeah. where's the revenue coming from, right? right. And we also, yeah, we also see in the news that a lot of companies are, as they, they, they said they are going to put the advertising um, on social media on hold. And when I read it, I thought of Facebook and I said, huh, how is Facebook going to deal with this? Because... <laughs> Companies are saying we're not going to advertise anymore because there is no point to it, right? right. We're barely getting business. So why are we spending so much on advertising budget? Yeah. Some people are okay. Yeah, companies like in Nigeria, we have Andela. Mm-hmm. Andela has closed down all their offices within the country and they've just gone remote completely. Okay. And they were renting space, you get. So these are the kind of things that would affect businesses at different levels, depending on the, the environment they're operating in. So you need to understand at, at, at the very basic level, right, how the changes in the environment is affecting the business that you are in. And if you're in consulting, then it means they have double work, but you have to understand how the macro environment is basically affecting all your clients and all the industries they are in. <laughs> so that when these clients come to you and ask, how do we how do we deal with this situation? You have an answer for them because right. really, when they when they think of you as maybe an auditor, or a consultant, or anything, these people think that you know everything. They don't care that maybe <laughs> you your work is in maybe only oil and gas, and you don't have so much experience in financial sector. They just say yeah. you're a consultant, you have the answers, and they ask you. Then we saw, we saw that over the last few months, a lot of consulting firms and Deloitte, PwC, KPN, they just kept on holding webinars consistently, right. trying to advise companies the risk management effects of um, COVID nineteen, how to move on from here to your businesses, um, the financial. Um, impact of COVID-19, cyber, cyber security became a really big issue this period, right? Cyber security effects of COVID-19. And these are things that information you can get from data. Right. Right. And okay. these data, just, they're, just, they're, just all, they're available everywhere. But part of the problem now is that you need to also check the accuracy of the data you're seeing. Yeah. You understand, if, if, are there any bias to the collection of this data? How does it affect right. us? How do we correct it? And things like that. So it's really wide. This, this, this right. is, is, is so huge wide. Yeah. yeah. It's a really huge field. And there's so much you need to, you need to put into um, consideration when you're thinking about data. So this is part of what data literacy is. I can go on and see where somebody says, or oh, 30% of men are this and women are this. And My first question won't be to just take the information at face value. I'm going to ask you, how did you get this data? Yes, yeah. Where did it come from? And so you see that um, a lot of people who give reports like this online, at the end, they say, go here for further information on data collection and how they analyze data. And you look at reports too from consulting firms who do analytics. They, at the end of their many reports, you always see where they talk about the limitations they had, how they collected the information, how they analyzed the information. And they, they like to give, they, they tend to give an explanation of how they came about this data, how they arrived at the conclusion that they arrived at. So right. this is part of what data literacy will help you question. And then you mm-hmm. can read these reports and you can say, oh no, this method was wrong. If you had done this differently, you would have gotten a different thing. And this is something very um, viral in the science community. We see that someone publishes a report about one thing. 